a user has no best friend. This is getting dark. Yeah, it's getting real deep here. I'm yeah. going there. <laughs> <laughs> This is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. Before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor for today's show, Hire.com. You're looking for a change. Uh, You have spent a couple of years at your company or at your current job, and you want to make that next big shift. But you're not sure where to start. I mean, you don't know what a competitive salary is these days. There are so many of these other problems. You don't know which companies are up and coming. You don't know which companies have the kind of culture that fits what you're looking for. Who are you going to call? Well, definitely not the Ghostbusters. But it's 2016, people. You don't call anyone these days. You go to a website. And that website is Hired.com. So after completing one simple application, the top employers in your area apply to hire you. So you receive personalized interview requests and upfront salary information so you can make informed decisions about uh, what opportunities you want to pursue. Usually, Hire.com's customers get a $1,000 hiring bonus. But as a listener fragmented by signing up with the show's special link, which is Hire.com slash fragmented, you get double the bonus. So that's $2,000. Boom. Just like that, they tack on another grand. How awesome is that? So if you're looking for a job, use Hire.com with our special link and they'll know you came from us. And that'll help support the show. Thanks again for sponsoring today's show, Hired. So Kaushik, have you ever done any like data binding with any other languages at all? Uh, not really. The only thing I've done that's sort of close to this is uh, the one that used to uh, with Angular, uh, mm-hmm. Angular yes. So this is in the web yeah. world. So, but nothing that I've actually used in Android development. I have used Rx Java to sort of like mimic that uh, functionality, but I actually haven't uh, worked with data binding per se. Yeah, I've done. A, I'm in the same camp. I, I've done a lot with Angular, and way back in the day, some stuff with like Silverlight, which is like super ancient, and WPF, what? and, and all that. Like, nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's interesting that this recently, this type of feature came out recently with uh, inside of Android, and so there's the Android like data binding support. And so I figured that it would be you know great if we were able to get someone on the show, and uh, luckily we had the stars align, and we were able to get someone on the show who knows a little bit about it, and. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Lisa Ray. Welcome to the show. Thank you guys very much. Hey, Lisa. How's it going? It is going pretty good. I am super stoked about today. You know, the funny thing is uh, I always had sort of a mild negative impression of uh, data binding just because like in the Angular days, it sort of like grew to this crazy wild thing. But many people, like many extremely smart people that I respect highly have said good things about data binding. So I am extremely excited to learn more about this from you. Great. Now, Lisa, for those who aren't familiar with maybe who you are and and your background, could you give us a little bit of information about you, maybe where you work, where you've worked before, uh, how you got started in Android, maybe how long you've been doing Android development, kind of anything around that nature? Oh, sure. Um, So who I am, obviously, my name is Lisa Ray, and I currently work at Genius. We're based in Brooklyn. Uh, we started as Rap Genius, and we do everything related to musical knowledge. We're known for our annotated song lyrics. And where I've worked before, um, I've worked as a mobile engineer at the New York Times. Uh, I worked for a couple years on the developer advocacy team at Google on Android and Google Glass, uh, Wear, stuff like that. And after that, Genius. And how I got started in Android, um, it's funny. My first job in mobile was actually on iOS. Whoa. Wow. Uh, <laughs> But then I, f- I fell into Android and I've I've never looked back as far. I've been doing it for about five years and I've been in New York the whole time. It's great here. That's awesome. And uh, for folks who want to find out more, we had the pleasure of uh, talking to Lisa also in our IO special episode. So you can mm-hmm. quickly take a listen there and uh, hear about uh, some of the other cool stuff that she's been up to. Uh, but Lisa, let's get uh, to data binding. What is this? crazy, cool, illustrious data binding that we keep hearing about. If you were to sum it up for our listeners, uh, what's a nice way of talking about data binding? Um, so 
the, the name probably gives you an idea of what data binding does. <laughs> but at a very high level, the reason you would use data binding in Android is it avoids a ton of code repetition and boilerplate. That's for, personally bothered me since the first day I looked at an Android application. Even a marginally complex layout, you're going to have a good zillion find view by ID setters, you have these model objects, and you know you want your view to represent your model object, but you need to unpack your model object into, you know, set title, set subtitle, set user.name, all of these little bits. If your object might or might not have a subtitle, then you're going to get null checks all over. So data binding, much like uh, Angular, which is one of the ones you called out in the intro, is going to let you connect your model and your view and get rid of all that boilerplate. Oh. Wait, is this, would you say that, is it something that once you get used to using it, would you say that you're more efficient in, in writing kind of this, this this code? I mean, I guess like, instead of, you know, doing the find view by ID, do you find yourself doing it faster by using data binding at the end of the day? Absolutely. Um, so I added data binding to my project gradually, but every commit where I used data binding was a net negative. So I was removing so many lines of code in every commit. Oh, interesting. So when interesting. you do when you use data binding, um, it generates a class for you that's basically a view holder for your layout. It gives you a reference to every view in your layout with an ID. It does this with one single pass through the view hierarchy, so it's more efficient. And it means you never need to call find view by ID. <laughs> you also don't need to create fields um, for your views, and you don't need to cast. So all of that completely gone. Oh. It's a lot of code. For the longest time, this has always been like such a pain uh, just because like the boilerplate is like when you actually look at the code, like you can't get to the essence quick enough. And uh, I, I remember like for the longest time, most uh, folks have been using Butterknife uh, as an alternative, right? Uh, but then with data binding now, like uh, I believe a lot of that functionality is provided by data binding. And there's also like some additionally cool stuff that you can do with data binding. Yeah, I mean, well, so I'd say Butterknife is kind of equivalent to the very first level of getting started with data binding. It's similar to what Google was saying when they first came out with the support action bar. And a lot of people were using action bar Sherlock. They were like, that's a perfectly fine library. If you're using that right now, there's no need to rip it out and switch immediately. But if you're going forward, if you're starting a new project, then go ahead and start now with the support action bar. And I would say, if you're starting a new project, go ahead and start now with data binding. Gotcha, gotcha. Interesting. Now, as like a lot of developers, we come from different backgrounds. I came from a world uh, of web, actually, where I did web development for over 10 years, and then I, I landed in Android. The thing that a lot of folks come when they're they're looking to they're looking to a new platform such as like Android and they're coming from from a different platform like the web is something they can draw a correlation to. And so when we say, hey, there's data binding in Android, what immediately is going to happen to those folks that have used this type of technology in other languages is immediately they're going to want to know how to do it. So if I was a listener, what would be the the best way that I know that I could get started with data binding and, and view binding uh, in general? Uh, well, it's very easy to get started. So I'd say your first step would be to look up the documentation. But if instead you'd want to just listen to me, <laughs> um, I would instruct you to put <laughs> layout tags with angle brackets mm -hmm. around the root of your layout file. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that's kind of repetitive, putting layout tags in your layout file. Very um, meta. But that that's the indicator to data binding that this is now a data binding layout. Um, there's no there's no need to use an Android namespace. It's just um, the tag itself is called layout. Oh, okay. And then in your view, wherever you would reference um, r dot layout dot your layout, such as an inflate statement or set content view, you're going to use data binding util dot set content view or data binding util dot inflate. And if you've already inflated your layout and you can't use data binding util there for some reason, you can say data binding util dot get binding and pass in the root view. And it will do that single traverse of the view hierarchy and generate your binding. And that's all you need to do to get started. That's enough to give you a generated binding class. And it will have setters like set my model if you're passing in data. Um, and it will have camel case names for all views that have an ID. Oh, interesting. It's more like a convention sort of thing. So uh, based on the ID that you have, it auto camel cases. So if I had my underscore uh, order underscore item. So then it would just be my order item in camel case that would uh, be provided as the setter. Exactly. If you have a text view and its name is product underscore title, mm -hmm. then in your generated binding class, 
uh, it would be called like product binding. Uh, you'll have a field called product binding dot um, product title. What's the magic behind all of this, right? Like, what what exactly happens, like in the background? Like, how is there like a class that's being generated? Is it similar to like annotation, uh, like an annotation processor? Like, how does it fit in? Uh, so I'm not infin- intimately familiar with how annotation processors work, but I can tell you that it is generating this code at compile time. So the great part about this is um, a few things. One, there is no reflection. So it's very, very fast. There's no performance hit at runtime. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. And the other thing is that since this code is generated at compile time, you can be sure that what you see when you're testing locally is what your users are going to get uh, in production. You can feel very safe using this. Nothing funny is ever going to happen to your code. And we can talk about it later, but it's also possible to inspect the generated code yourself. Sorry, you mentioned there's like a compile time check that happened. So it's going to be pretty difficult for you to shoot yourself in the foot with this. Hopefully. Right. So at, basically, this code is generated at compile time. So if you make a mistake in your um, in your binding, if you try and pass in an object that's different than the type you declared, or if you write an expression, a view binding expression in your layout that isn't correct, mm-hmm. it'll simply throw an error at compile time. Very close. So there's a two way sort of like double binding that happens. How exactly does it map to the data model you talked about how it would be easy to like inflate your view you just like replace the apis how exactly does it map to an object say i have like a view right like a screen which has like a user profile and i want to bind it to essentially a user object and all the data how, how would one go about that um so good question this is definitely the next step you would do um so inside your layout tag that we made earlier um uh, first thing in there before you get to your root view tag in your layout, you're going to insert a data tag. And inside there, you can pass in a variable. You give it a name. I like to keep it simple. I I would call this one user. Okay. And then you declare the type. So it would be, you know, com.myapp.user. Then in your XML, you would go to the text view. Say you would call this user underscore name would be its ID, where where you'd set the text would be Android text. And then you get what we call, I guess, We can call it the data binding mustache, where you have Android text equals, instead of hard coding a string or putting a string resource, you'll write at start bracket, user.name, close bracket. And this is the format for all data binding expressions. It lets data binding strip them out of the XML during pre-processing. So if you look at the generated XML, this Android text expression won't be there anymore. When you run your app, the binding is going to go in, take your user, um, once you set your user object on the binding, it's going to automatically set that value, user.name, uh, using set text on that text view in your layout. Ah, that makes sense. So to back off and give this a, a summary, after you do um, data binding util set content view, all you have to do is go user binding, set user, and pass your object. That's it, you're done your whole view will be set up. And then everything's hydrated from there. Exactly. Oh, wow. That is, that is pretty cool. One uh, quick aside, like, is it actually called the data mining mustache operator or like, are we just... To be totally honest, I'm not sure. I've seen a couple talks on it and I can't remember if they call it anything. <laughs> well, we shall coin the term together today. Uh, the... <laughs> I, I, work, I work by myself. So to be honest, I'm not sure I've ever said it out loud before today. <laughs> <laughs> Because previously, I know uh, uh, with Java documentation, it's the exact reverse where you have the open curly brace and then you have an at operator. So that makes it look like a rose, you know? So uh, I, I have seen in some contexts it being called like the rose operator. So this one looks more like a mustache. So yeah, I like I, it. I have heard mustache before. <laughs> <laughs> so we have like the very basic you know, model we're passing in, we're binding it, everything's looking good. What a, And that seems pretty straightforward. But what about getting into like some more complex situations where maybe we have some like a string resource with some string formatting placeholders. So we may want to put a dollar sign space in a percent D or something else of that nature. How does that work or, or, or what do we do in that situation in regards to data binding? Uh, so I think this is where you begin to see data binding really shine because these little things are totally common. You're going to want to do them in almost every situation where you're applying a simple model to a simple view, but they really blow up your controller or whatever, with, or your activity with boilerplate. Um, so there are shortcuts in data binding. Uh, we call them view binding expressions. And you can 
use formatted strings directly in that data binding expression. Oh, whoa, really? Instead of doing at string, you'd do at string price template, and then you'd put in product dot price, and it will format it for you. It will fetch the string from resources, feed it through string dot format. And that's done right in the XML, right? Right in the XML, yeah. And there's more that you can do um, from there. For example, you can do conditional logic, um, mm -hmm. like ternary operators. So you can say... Um, Would this be like an interesting example where, uh, say, we have a sale and because we only give only special customers a certain sale price. So we can say, if your name starts with Kaushik, so like, you know, you have the mustache operator and then you say order dot uh, is Kaushik <laughs> as like your ternary operation. And then the result uh, is you display a lower price and if it's done then you can display a higher price <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that would be a good example um i find that i use ternary operators a lot for visibility it's a very common thing you do in a view where you have an optional field say you have a subtitle and if you don't have a subtitle then you want to hide the subtitle mm -hmm. so um you can say if the subtitle is null visibility dot gone otherwise visibility visible. Ah. I've actually written a shortcut because I use that one so much. Um, but it's useful for all kinds of things. Perhaps for one category of user, you might want to show a different formatted string or show the text in a different color. You make these little choices all over your application. This is very helpful. Um, and so when you said shortcut, uh, did, did you mean like an Android Studio shortcut or is this some other wrapper? A data binding shortcut. What? What is this sorcery? Can you explain what this is? Basically, I'm um, what we're doing here is we're inserting our view binding expressions in existing Android attributes. So here we're setting a formatted price in the Android text attribute of a text view. But what you can do is you can use data binding to define your own custom attributes. Oh, that's pretty cool. So uh, when you say custom attributes, you mean this is directly in the layout itself? So like how directly we... Directly in the layout. You can oh. make up your own. Wow. Oh, that's pretty cool. Before, before we get to this, I want to mention one other really cool thing about view binding expressions. If you use these directly in the layout, accessing your model's fields, in most cases, you get null safety. Ah, yes. So if I set the subtitles text to be user.subtitle, but there is no subtitle, it's just going to be the default, which is an empty string. Oh, so even if the subtitle field was null as against, like, you know, an empty string. Exactly. And even if I use it in an expression, so, for example, I say user dot subtitle dot capitalize or something along those lines. Exactly. Yeah. So it's going case, to do. Yeah. It's going to do. Or if I a, a good example here, I think would be um, if there if you have nested objects, if you have user dot friend dot name. Mm -hmm, Every mm -hmm. user has a best friend, and you want to show their best friend's name. So if you fill in a field with user dot best friend dot name, and the best friend is, is null or forbid, but the user itself is null you're still just going to get the default. There's null checking all the way down. There's a very oh. couple edge cases where you're not going to get null checking, but in most cases, this makes your life really simple. So do we need to, to worry about the null coalescing operator at all, or we can just throw that out the window because all these null checks are done for us? Uh, the null coalescing operator can be handy if you don't, if you want to provide your own default. So for example, if the best friend in this example was null, then we're just going to get an empty string. But maybe you want to say, user has no friends. <gasps> so you would use the null coalescing operator to say user.bestfriend.name or if that's null, your user has no best friend. This is getting dark. Yeah, it's getting real deep here. I'm going there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this null, the null safety check is pretty spectacular. I had, uh, yeah, I had no idea this thing existed. This is pretty cool. We have the data that sometimes, you know, in the app, uh, but sometimes it, changes behind the scenes in random different ways depending upon how i've implemented it you know this could happen maybe if a server sent a, an update down maybe we've performed some polling operation anything like that how do we get those updates into you know the into the model and basically down push it down into the view is there any support for that at all uh, absolutely so data binding doesn't just move this data from your model into your view once it can do it over and over and it can do it uh, piecemeal so it doesn't have to update the entire view it can update just individual fields and it can be really smart about it oh interesting so the very simplest way would just be like i get a new user from the server i set user i go set user new user but generally you want to be smarter about it than that so you would create a model which extends base observable uh, observable is an interface and 
generally, I would make this a view model. I wouldn't go messing with my own pristine models that represent what I'm getting from the server. Why is that, though? Uh, because there's a couple of reasons. Uh, first, I don't want to go make all of my model objects extend base observable. It's going to make them messy. Suppose something else wants me to extend from them. We're just going to have a fight. There's a lot of reasons. <laughs> The next reason is that you sometimes you can imagine that your logic in the XML may get a bit complicated. Mm -hmm. Some people are probably already thinking, I don't want this logic in my XML at all, ever. This is not where it belongs. Exactly. Yeah, that was my initial thinking as well. I was going to follow up. So the answer is you don't have to use any of these view data uh, view binding expressions if you don't want to. You could just directly bind one field on a view model. Rather, it would correspond to one method on the view model to one attribute in a view and you can have that one-to-one -one correspondence with no logic at all in the xml and you can do that by having a view model contain all this logic so i had a quick question so i was thinking about this uh, like as you mentioned and this makes a lot of sense uh, but it makes sense when you have like a single field like we t briefly touched about like having nested stuff right so what if uh, so let's take an example right so like don's a pretty uh, friendly chap if I had like Don as like my model, right? And then I say, get friends and say you had like 20 friends come up. How does that map towards? So like, I'm trying to visualize how I would like build this up. And like in my view model, typically what I would do is I would send down a list of persons mm -hmm. or list of users or something, right? How exactly would I use that in my XML? Does that question make sense? Um, yes. I think in that question, in that case, you're probably going to want to manage that using like the adapter of a recycler view. Ah, uh, okay, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, okay. The general case for using um, an observable is that you're going to have your view model. It extends observable. And then in there, all of the fields that you want to bind in your layout are represented by methods. So you would have get title, get subtitle. Inside these, you can get as complicated as you want calculating how you're going to produce that title. And then you annotate each method with bindable, at bindable. Bindable, interesting, okay. Yeah, and this is uh, an annotation that's going to signal to data binding that it needs to generate fields. So you're going to end up being able to access that method in your layout by going view model dot, if the method is get title, you'll be able to do view model dot title okay. in your layout. And when you change that property, Whenever you set the thing in your view model that causes a change, you'll call notify property change, and then you'll do br dot title. Br is a generated class data binding makes that's similar. Uh, it's br dot java. It's similar to r dot java. Oh, okay. It's just a long list of unique integers that represent one of these generated fields. If you want to change everything, if you want to nuke everything, just call notify change. Is there a way to get notified? Uh, as a listener in that, um, it could be in Java or whatever, saying, hey, this has changed. Because maybe uh, if, let's say, part of my model changes, so the, the view updates. But at that point, I want to then initiate some type of animation to let the user know, hey, this part of the screen has changed. Are there any callbacks or anything like that that are available to you? I don't think this particular mechanism is designed to do that. Uh, okay. In this case, the change is being initiated by you. Oh, okay. All so right. This is when you would be getting a new user from the server and saying view model that set user. You would structure it so that every part of your view that uses the user, you'll say notify property changed on that. So this is a bit manual, but um, it's also extremely flexible. Say that you have a view model that depends on several things. Like in my app, I do a lot of displaying song pages, but a song might be displayed differently if a user is logged in or not. So I have a view model that depends on a user, the current user, and then also the song. And when I change one, I have to update certain properties, but not all. And these changes end up being really efficient because data binding classes use bitwise flags to mark if a property has changed on a view. So when you call notify property change, it's basically going to flip these dirty bits and then post a change. So I can change a handful of fields it will flip all the dirty bits on those appropriate, like just on those properties that are going to change. And then it'll post one change to the UI thread. That is, oh, that is pretty slick. Because uh, the question that I basically had was like, oh, you mentioned like this is, uh, it's done in a sort of efficient manner. And so I was trying to understand like, how does it, uh, how does it handle that? But it, it seems like this, like, yeah, like 
all these uh, different uh, signals like the notify property change and a whole bunch of things sort of indicate that's where it would happen. So does that mean uh, if I don't have those signals in, does that basically mean that it doesn't get updated? I would presume so. Uh, yes, that <laughs> is exactly what it means. So if you forget to call prop, uh, notify property changed, then your view will not be updated and you'll be wondering what is going on. Okay. But okay. Luckily, <laughs> I've found it pretty easy to track these down. Um, for the most part, I've found that Defining a view model where I say when I change these methods, the return values of these methods will change has really freed me from wondering about questions like when I update this model, what part of my view should change? That's what's taken care of for you because in your layout, uh, you decide where you use the results of these methods and you no longer, you, it completely disconnects your view and updating your model. So for me, that's been tremendously helpful. So we can we can set data on on the view by taking the model and basically you know using these util methods you told us about. This uh, seems kind of very like one way, like I'm pushing the data to the screen itself. Does the data binding support an Android? Does it support support like a two way data binding? And if so, how how does one enable that? So it does support it. This is new. So when we they first launched data binding, there was only one way binding, and as you see, it's. It can still be really powerful, but it was very much one way. I think there was a big talk on this at IO on advanced data binding is what they call it, this technique. And sure enough, there is literal two-way binding. Nice. So what you do is inside the data binding mustache, after the at sign, you go equal sign. Oh, okay. So now we have to come up with a new name for this operator. What does that look yeah. like? <laughs> I guess it's not really. It's between the at sign and the bracket. And when you do this, so say you would set Android, you have an edit text, um, and you have you're setting it to um, user dot name. You're letting the user edit their profile. So if you do, if you add this equals and use two way binding, then it's going to push um, any changes the user makes directly back into the model, and it's going to call the setter on your model. Oh, okay. So at any point after the user is editing, your model will be updated to what they've put. Ah. So that's great for keeping it in sync. But as for what you were asking earlier about literally getting notified when that happens, um, you're going to have to get a little more crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to have to set some kind of a listener or uh, get a method callback, right? So the first, the first really naive way is just to pass in an object that contains or is, say, um, a text watcher. This isn't a very good way, but you could. There's an attribute called on text changed, mm -hmm. and you could pass a text watcher object into your binding, set it on there, and then in the layout set that object as the value. But I don't recommend this because you'll need one for every click listener. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's not okay, really an right. So yeah, yeah, you're not necessarily eliminating any boilerplate at that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So to move on to what they talked about in this presentation is that you can, first, you can use method re references. You can actually import, uh, say, a presenter object into your binding. So now you're setting on your binding two things. You're setting the model and you're setting a presenter. And you can... Define that in on text change, you want presenter on click. And you do this with two um, colon marks. So inside the data binding mustache, your view binding expression is going to be presenter, um, two colons, and then the method name on click. And so what that does is that I think this is at bind time. It actually goes and it creates, it generates an on click listener that calls that method. And this is in your binding. Very cool. So yeah, that was like my initial question because uh, Butter Knife provides something similar, right? Like where you have an on annotation saying on long click and on click. And so uh, exactly. in, in the initial days, my my thing was like, well, that's a big reduction in boilerplate too. So how do I achieve that? So it seems there's an answer for that too. Um, you can you can go one step beyond this. Um, rather than just generating click listeners, um, you can actually have methods called dynamically at runtime. And you can do this using lambda notation or a, a sort of lambda notation directly in the layout. And this weirds me out a little, but it's, <laughs> I can see that it's also very it's also very cool that you're able to do it at all. So you could do in your Android on click, uh, you'll actually write what looks like 
a, a lambda expression, you'll do two parentheses and then a right facing arrow, like a dash. <laughs> uh, what's that right V? Ah, yes, the um, lambda. Then you yeah, would do, uh-huh. yeah, and then you'll do presenter dot. So it doesn't have to be on click. It could be presenter dot save user. Um, so you can actually specifically call a method, like a meaningful method, not just an on click callback, directly from your layout. And just like for so folks uh, know the double colon operator is like what we call a method reference in the land of Java 8, right? So I can imagine as they were improving this uh, with the recent announcements with the Jack uh, tool chain and like, you know, the new Java 8 stuff, I'm sure the people who who worked on this were like, well, we should really get in the Java 8 advantages inside uh, uh, the data binding stuff. So I can see that's why. So even though like these, when we talk about these, they sound complicated, but when you look at them, they look like very standard java 8 sort of uh, notations right right yeah so it was bizarre to me to see this uh in a layout but it actually reads and feels very naturally especially compared to java 8 compared to the way that android gotcha, studio folds gotcha. your code. so i do have like an orthogonal question that's kind of been uh chunking away in the background here and that is how does android studio handle all the stuff in the view let's say i need to refactor a method name or something like that and i need to you know change name is a perfect example is that supported in the tooling currently or or do you know at all um yes a good question the only thing i think that's not currently supported really really well is refactoring that if you need to um if you need to change a method in say your view model um it won't automatically go and rename your references to the generated field in the layout so if i had if i had a a method called say set title and i wanted to change it to set styled title i have to go into my layout and manually change view model dot title to view model dot styled title uh, in every other respect android studio support for data binding is actually really great right now it will regen. It will generate these uh, br fields on the fly, just the same way it generates r fields when you make a change. Um, there's code completion in XML. There's even as you type, it will show you errors if you've written something that probably won't compile. And uh, I'm not too sure because I remember seeing one of these talks uh, where they talked and they said they are thinking about improving this uh, in the future, right? Uh, am I just like dreaming about that, or is that something that was mentioned? Oh, yeah, I, I absolutely think that they intend to handle it. I know that data binding is still under active right, development. Right. So I think that would be quite high on the list. Um, I remember I started using it before code completion was working. Whoa. Oh. So I think, they're, they're, <laughs> I think they're very, I know, determined. Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, yeah. I think they're very, very aware. They know how much that matters. So And that probably explains why you know all of this thing, like hands down. Because like if you weren't using autocomplete, like today, I don't even know half the names of the stuff that I do. I just trust Android Studio to autocomplete my way through all of the code that I write. So... <laughs> To be fair, uh, it was only that when you, inside a view uh, view binding expression, it wouldn't autocomplete. So you had to type out yourself user dot name. But I think I could handle. Well, that. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's that would still be pretty tricky for me. Okay, so a lot of this that we've talked about is uh, getting sort of like the basic stuff ironed out, right? But it's time to like sort of up our game and go into like the world of black magic and like bring in all the sorcery because. I know, and this is like one of the, uh, this is quite early on. I know like some of the really cool things that people have been able to do with data bindings. Uh, you were one of the very early few who sort of like really took data binding to the next level, right? Uh, I remember uh, the, the whole custom font stuff. That was one thing that uh, you use data binding in a very uh, interesting manner that I, I know for a fact, many folks at Google who worked on data binding said that they didn't expect the community community to come up with some of these innovative ways. So, could you talk a little about how you go about some of those things? Yeah, one of one of my absolute personal favorite things with data binding is it let me get rid of a lot of pet peeves in Android from the very beginning. And as somebody who's worked a lot with typography and on uh, t- layouts that involve lots of text, close to my heart is the fact that there is no attribute in XML in Android that lets you set a custom font. So. One of the first things that came to my mind once I started playing with data binding, and I realized that you could define a custom attribute, was that maybe you could use this to set a font. And it turns out you can. Uh, So the way you do this is you make something called a binding adapter. And it's a public static method. You annotate it with binding adapter. And then it has an input 
um, its inputs will be the view you're using it on and the type of input you expect. So in this case, I was sending in the string representing the font. And inside your method, you can do whatever you want and you have access to the view. So you can, you know, inflate, uh, sorry, read that font from assets and set it on the text view. Uh, but you can go much, much wilder than this. You can make your own custom ones. Um, I was saying earlier, I made a shortcut for visibility because I got frustrated with typing ternary expressions that were like, if this, then view.visible, otherwise view.gone. So I made an attribute called visible and it just takes in any view and it uh, accepts a Boolean. So I could say, you know, so instead of using a ternary expression, I can simply pass the thing I want to be true. That is smart. So instead real. of the standard one, which is uh, visibility, I imagine, right? Like if visibility is like the standard one. Right, exactly. Which has the three values, but I find that, you know, in five years, I can probably count on one hand how many times I've used invisible. So it's not like I got rid of the original uh, view setter method. It's still there, but I find that I rarely use it. Oh. So it just it, it's whatever your pet peeve is. You can sit in there, you can actually go in, define your own custom attributes on any view. And this is something that's generally not possible in Java, especially in Android, because so many methods are private or hidden, and you really can't go in, extend classes, and tweak them to be the way you want. Except in this case, data binding kind of lets you do that. Okay, let's say I have uh, some some code that, that I would like to use inside of my view, but it's maybe not attached to my model. Like I've got some utility methods that help me do certain formatting or anything of that nature. Can I use those methods uh, in correlation with the data binding library? Um, so yeah, you absolutely can. If you're comfortable with getting this code into your layout, um, then you don't just have to have that variable block where you um, declare your model. You can also have an import block. Again, this is inside the data tag in the layout. Um, so you'll add one that's uh, an import tag, and then you just say the type of the class you want to import. And then you can use it in your uh, view binding expressions. So you could be like uh, Android text equal, you know, data binding squiggles, um, date util dot make formatted date string my model dot date. Um, I won't say, okay, if you go look at my code right now, it's definitely in a couple places where I had a perfectly simple model that was one-to-one -one, uh, its fields with my layout. And I just had one case where I wanted to do this and didn't want to make a view model. Um, I don't think these things are black and white, but generally I prefer to make this a method, a bindable method on my view model instead. But yes, you can do it. You absolutely can do it. So a few moments ago, we were we had mentioned the word adapter and when we, as being Android developers, when we think of adapters, we think of lists and we think of recycler views and all that kind of stuff. And when I start thinking about recycler views, I start thinking about the various different implementations you can have, such as recycler views with multiple different view types. It, can you ha have that type of scenario in data binding? Can I have multiple view types and can data, data binding help me in that situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, any place you're inflating a layout, traditionally, data binding can help you. So in, in the case of view holder, it's actually really interesting because view holder is enforcing the view holder, sorry, recycler view is enforcing the view holder um, pattern. And a binding is very, very similar to a view holder. It's a class with references to all of your views uh, in your layout. So you can actually make a generic view holder that just holds a binding. And you can use that no matter how many view types you have in your recycler view. So that's one really nice um, benefit. It saves you a lot of work of writing these view holders, which can be tedious. And if you had multiple types of view holders, uh, you how would one... Spe oh, you, inside that gener generic view holder, you could always just point to a different type. Uh, right. So you would have a view holder... Um, and then it would be, you could say, parameterize your view holder and take a, you know, anything extending view data binding. So you could pass the binding in in the constructor. And then you could just use one view binder, uh, sorry, one view holder for all of your different types of bindings um, if you have more than one view type. One thing I do want to mention, and this bit me really badly when I first started, I had a lot of jumping in my list view right up, and I thought, my God. This is probably data binding. There's probably some bug. I'm going to have to rip out the whole last week of work. <laughs> uh, it turns out this effort to be efficient, where it sort of it will mark all of your properties dirty, and then it will post instructions to refresh itself to the UI thread. This is, can cause flickering in a recycler view if it's being scrolled really, really fast. What you want to do is you want to force your object to update 
as soon as you call binding dot set my model object. And you do this by saying binding dot execute pending bindings. It just says do this as soon as possible. Don't send this to the tail of the queue. And with that, there are no longer any more problems with recycler view. Oh, interesting. So why didn't why isn't that the default though? Like why don't you just do that anyway? Um, well, uh, it's a good question. I think the problem is that there's the whole of recycler view is still pretty open beyond enforcing the view holder pattern. Oh. There's not a lot that's enforced about recycler view at all. So I think we could see a model project in the future that provides this for you, uh, some example project, but it's unlikely that you're going to see that as like a default in, say, I don't know, a data binding recycler view adapter. It seems a little too prescriptive for the way recycler view works. But a lint warning would certainly uh, not be out of line. I guess at this point, like, it seems like data binding is pretty amazing. It seems like it's a one library that would help with a whole bunch of these other sort of things. But obviously, as is the case with any library, there are certain disadvantages to uh, having a data binding, right? Because I remember, and this is in the web world with AngularJS, like this was one thing that people always, anytime they want to like bring up a negative point against uh, any sort of uh where you write actual code in like sort of a layout uh, kind of context, they always say, oh, look what happened to AngularJS, right? Like you had so much code in there and then like that sort of like bogs you down. And then at that point, it, it all becomes pretty messy. So one uh, common ding against uh, data binding is like, well, you could see yourself getting into that, right? Do you think that's like a fair uh, reason? Is it fair to call that as a disadvantage for data binding? Um, it's totally fair. And it's really easy to get into this state because your first instinct is to think, let me import my model object into the layout. Uh, you quickly find that you've been doing way more manipulation on your model object in your activity or in whatever you were using before than you ever realized. And yeah, you shouldn't have tons of that code in your layout. You shouldn't. Um, it's brittle. It's, it's hard to test, as you pointed out. Um, and it's just confusing. XML is not a place for this code. And so what I'd say is you should be using view models in this case. It's definitely, like I said, with recycler view, uh, this is also not a prescriptive framework. It gives you as much rope as you want. So you need to decide with your team, what's the right level for you? Does your team just want to stop at um, view binding? Do you just want it to generate these bindings, which are similar to view holders? You can use view binding and get tremendous benefits from it, like a lot of boilerplate reduction, without even using the data block, without even passing in models and using the binding part, the data binding part. Other teams may be eager to use lambdas, so it's really just up to you. Personally, I'm not using two-way binding, yet, and I'm not using lambdas. I've tried them out, and then I took it out because I'm not convinced I've got a comfortable structure in my app right now um, to support that flow. That makes a lot of sense. And I like uh, the progression that you mentioned. Uh, and we went through this over the course of this episode. So you start off with basically just the sort of view binding layer. And so like you start off with that, get a feel of how it works. And then you can move on to the data layer and add like the, you know, the data tag and the data attribute in your layout. So then you sort of like use that as the next step. And then step three, if you want to go really crazy, is like with the Lambda stuff uh, as such. So, uh, I mean, again, yeah, the, like you rightly said, even progressing up to step two can bring a huge amount of advantages. Right. So uh, another question is, I mean, I wouldn't feel comfortable using data binding unless I know for a fact that this is something that Google is fully supporting and that it isn't in like some crazy alpha stage and like my code is breaking. And then I have this release that I have to push out tomorrow and my product manager comes and tells me, hey, I need to get this done. And I tell him, hey, data binding is not working. Like, you know, he's not going <laughs> to buy that. <laughs> so is data binding stable? Um, yeah, it's absolutely stable and it is in production. And if you don't believe me, you can watch the talk at IO where they get up on stage and say, data binding is production ready. Oh, sweet. Oh, okay. So they have officially yeah. like given the blessing. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay. So I think it was um, two years ago at IO when it was announced. And then this year they got up there and they said, we didn't do a big announcement, but it is ready. It is fully integrated. It is stable and you should use it in your production apps if you want. Uh, and Google is is actively continuing to develop it. So if you're wondering, is Google invested in right, this right. or is it just going to, you know, slowly become deprecated? Not that Google's ever done that with a product. Uh, that's not the case. Like You can see that they just came out with two-way binding. They just came out with the lambdas. So 
I would say at this point, God forbid, but if I had to rip data binding out of my app, it would be a nightmare. <laughs> On the other hand, if I had to write my app again from scratch without using data binding, that would also be a nightmare. So I'm glad it's there for me and I hope it never goes away. That is pretty high praise. I like that. Yeah, that that gives me also confidence knowing that, yeah, that you feel confident enough to use it with such. Once you write an app without ever having to write find view by ID <laughs> and pass all of your view classes, you'll wonder how you did it for so many years. There's um, in Android Studio, there's the new feature instant run that's, you know, been and talked about uh, a lot of some people love it some people don't i'm kind of on the fence uh, i think it's a great engineering marvel some of the things that the tooling team is doing and i commend them for it and i can't wait to see how it progresses but i'm wondering how this works with data binding if i change something in the xml how does that work with instant run and have you noticed any problems um well in the beginning instant run didn't work with data binding at all but <laughs> happily that time has passed and i can say that I haven't noticed any problems that I can specifically blame on data binding and instant run. Once in a while, instant run doesn't get my changes, but I think it plays well with data binding. So no, no problems there. Um, this The only problem I can say, and this is not instant run related at all, but if you make a problem in one of your data binding files, you know, you mistype a character, you add a, you know, you mash on the keyboard or something, you'll get an error when you try and compile and you get a meaningful, helpful error, which is good. But the problem is before the error, it prints out a list of pretty much every class where you use data binding and says something like data binding couldn't be found. The binding for this uh, yeah. generated oh. by <laughs> So you get this huge scary list of bindings that if if you use it throughout your app can be extremely long. And then at the bottom is the oh, this, you know, this parenthesis is not valid in this position in this layout file. Click here to fix it. Um, so yeah, if you see these errors, don't don't give up. <laughs> Just scroll all the way to the bottom. Everything is that's, that's a very good tip because I've uh I've been in the situations before you see this huge trace of just like wall of error text and you're like, oh goodness, I don't know where what's going on now. Yeah. So the the errors again in the beginning were a little were a little um lacking. They're actually they're really helpful now. They tell you exactly what's wrong. Just scroll to the bottom. Yeah. This has been pretty amazing. Like there's a lot of things. I'm actually pretty stoked to try this. Uh but if I wanted to go the next leg, and uh, do you have any resources you can point us to where we can sort of quickly uh, get a little more and understand more about data binding and like how we can push forward? Yeah, absolutely. So for uh, a basic getting started primer, I actually just recommend the Android documentation. Um, it was written about a year ago when data binding was first launched, and it's a really good primer uh, for basic data binding, which is one-way data binding. If you want to go beyond that and start doing the two-way uh, method references, so on, then you should watch the talk that was given at uh, Google I.O. 2016 called Advanced Data Binding. And we'll make sure to add uh, links to all of these uh, in the show notes so folks who are curious uh, can quickly get access to a lot of these things. Any other resources? Um, let's see. There's um, There was a talk, a great uh, overview of data binding in general, how it works, how to use it at Android Dev Summit, which is also online. Um, I talked very briefly. I gave a lightning talk at an Android spring cleaning event that Square threw in New York. Oh, very cool. Okay. But as far as like um, what originally got me into this, um, there was a talk by Jacob Tabak at DroidCon New York uh, in 2015 last year. And that's what inspired me. Even though I'd heard about it before, that's when I said, okay, this is ready. I can try it now. And to give him a shout out, I think he's going to be giving an update to that talk this year at DreadCon New York. We will stay tuned to that. And when the videos come out, we will make sure we follow those. Lisa, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, if folks want to reach out to you or they have uh, more questions on data binding, uh, what's the best place to uh, reach you? Um, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm at Lisa Ray, Ray with a W, Z. So Lisa Ray Z. And my personal website is xray.com. Again, uh, Ray with a W. That is probably one of the coolest domain names I've seen, xray.com. <laughs> Thank you. I hardly update it, but there it is. Um, but if, also, if you want to speak to me in person, I'm going to be getting around a lot this year. I'm going to be speaking at DroidCon New York also. I'll, I'll, I'm speaking at RecyclerView, but I'm happy to talk about data binding. And also be at DroidCon London. So please find me, ask me questions. I love it. 
Fantastic. So if folks want to find the show notes for this episode, fragmentedpodcast.com slash episodes slash the episode number is where you can find out more about the show notes. If you want to reach out to Don, Don, how do we do that? The best way to get a hold of me is just going to be through Twitter, and that's at Don Felker. If you really want to, you can hit my website at donfelker.com, but it's just best to get a hold of me on Twitter. That's good. And uh, I am at Kaushik Gopal on Twitter, and kaush.co is my website. If you have feedback for us on anything fragmented related, we also have a Twitter handle called Fragmented Cast. So that's uh, you should follow that handle if you want to stay tuned to some of the updates we keep pushing out here. Lisa, thank you so much. We hope you'll come on to the show the next time both Don and I will be on top of our double binding game. Uh, and when I say double binding, obviously, I mean data binding. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for inviting no, this me. This is a pleasure. And uh, thank you so much. And before we sign off from our double binding ways, we want to thank Hire.com again for sponsoring today's show. They are a great way to find your next big venture. They'll walk you through the otherwise extremely rocky process of interviewing and finding your next job. Uh, if you'll end up getting a job through Hired.com, they'll give you a thousand dollar bonus. But as a special thank you, if you use their link, Hired.com slash Fragmented, uh, you'll double that bonus. So instead of thousand, you'll get two thousand dollars. Thanks again for sponsoring today's show, Hired. 